Here's the deal. Info at kingofkingswc.com. That's the email address. I see all the emails that come through. I don't answer them all, but I send them to the right person on our team. Um, I could never address all the questions that this amount of people would have and the people that are online would have. So I'm just going to give you my perspective on what happened this week. And here's the one thing I can guarantee you. Not everybody's going to be happy because <laughs> that's impossible to do. Uh, and, and that's okay. I don't mind that, that that's the case because when my wife and I decided that we were going to come out here in 1999, um, a couple of years of prayer had gone into that decision. And we just made a decision then that we had to be honest with who we are and what we do and who we're aligned with and that, that we're not going to be for everybody. And there is no one way of doing things that's going to be for everybody. So if you're too worried about not hurting anybody's feelings, it's very hard to have a church because the gospel challenges us to live a very difficult, godly life in the midst of a secular culture. So uh, I just want to make sure everybody knows that we feel called to do this not because of money or, or because it's a job. It's because we were both so grateful when we got saved that we felt this was one way that we could pay the Lord back. And because he saved our lives, literally, that it was a small price to say, I'm going to work on your behalf for the rest of my life to try to help other people know you and understand you. And we all have our own DNA and our own way we do that. And Trisha and I are even very different people. But, but we've come to see that as a plus because we both bring different gifts to the table. And instead of feeling like we're adversaries, we realize we're allies and she can do things I can't and I can do things that she can't. So we can actually be, the sum of the parts can be greater than the individual people. Isn't that amazing? And that's how the whole body of Christ works. And I think it's also amazing that God has, is no respecter of persons in the way that he doesn't show favorites. Because you could have a big, high degree of education, but if you're not filled with the Holy Spirit and you're a legalist, you could end up killing people with the Word of God, right? And that's right out of the Bible. And, and you could be somebody, I could tell you stories about a lady named Jackie Pullinger, who was a highly educated English woman who went to Hong Kong at the age of 18, and she took a one-way trip on a ship back then and did not know what was going to happen when she got there and spent the next 40-plus years of her life working with the poorest people in Hong Kong, the drug addicts, and, and miracles and signs and wonders. People that never read a book in their life, they were junkies from the time they were little children, were prophesying scripture by the power of Holy Spirit. That's the God we serve. That's who, that's who we believe in. He's a miracle-working God. And the genius to me of Jesus is that that junkie in Hong Kong who was 13 years old and had been strung out on heroin is no different than the CEO in New York City uh, in the big boardroom. In God's eyes, what he says applies to all of humanity. That's not easy to do, is it? That takes genius, and he is a genius. And not everybody even thinks of him that way. So I'm, I'm all in to serve the Lord. I'm all in to say that we're not going to water down the word because we want to tickle people's ears and make it easier to serve God. It's not easy to serve God in a secular society, especially. And I work on Wall Street, and I'm with really smart people from all around the world, and they're just as lost as anybody else. And they can be just as found in, Christian, in the Christian world as anybody else. So we're in the belly of the beast, if you like to put it that way. If the love of money is the root of all evil and New York City is the financial capital of the world, then you could argue that's a pretty strong spiritual warfare and people are still getting saved. You know, Jesus said it's, it's harder for a rich man to get into the kingdom than for a camel to go through the eye of a needle. He didn't say it's impossible, though, did he? He just said it's hard. Well, it's hard. It's hard today to be open about everything that you believe as a Christian in the corporate world of America. So you have to really take it each case each person, each situation. When Paul said pray at all times, I believe this is what he was talking about, how to handle every situation. I'm not going to read some big statement today. I know a lot of people will. That's fine. But it would, to me, the analogy would be like me coming home and Trisha say, how was your day? And I read her statement. <laughs> you know, like, that's not how God is. 
friend of ours named Daniel Amstutz, uh, he's a really gifted worship leader, he used to say that about God, you know, like we don't necessarily just have to sing about God, we could sing to God, and, and we could be very intimate in that relationship with him, and it should be just from the heart, right? So the song that we sang today, that was the first time we ever did it. What great timing, right? We thank you, Diana, for uh, recommending that song. Nothing else will do. And it's Carrie Job's husband is the guy that wrote it, was one of the people that wrote it. And you could just hear that he was just waiting before the Lord. And this thing was birthed on the inside of him. And that song came out. So that's the relationship. That was the point Daniel Amsutz was trying to make, is that we can have this intimate relationship with God. And I, I'd say probably one of the biggest challenges of the last few months about, around the election is what Trisha said, is to keep seeing the other person who's opposing you through the eyes of God. And what does God see when he looks at that person who's screaming at you or yelling at you or calling you whatever names? And this could even be within the church, right? That you have to maintain rule of your spirit. That's what it says in Proverbs. A person who doesn't rule their spirit is like a city with the walls broken down. Okay, and that's four years ago. I was saying that about President Trump. Pray that for him when he got elected because there have been many times when it was apparent to me that he wasn't ruling his spirit well. He was allowing his, whatever way you want to describe that, he, you know, strong emotions to override him. And that made it easy for his opponents to attack him, all right? And that's part of spiritual warfare. You got to recognize if, if people didn't believe in spiritual warfare before, like if this year didn't do it, the last 12 months, I don't know what will, but it's very real. And it's also very biblical, right? And I'm not meaning to criticize him now, because when you're in the limelight, anybody is going to look at you, and, and, and there will be things that will be said about you, and misinterpretations, and fake news, and all of the things that I'm not going to get into. But you could also just hear what he said personally, right? That's not fake news. He was just very open about what he was feeling, and you could argue that there were times he wasn't ruling his spirit. So if there's a lesson to be learned, that's one of them. Let's keep praying for our leaders to be able to keep their calm and not get baited by the enemy to where they say something that can then be used against them, right? And that's why the Bible's so big about leadership and about people of integrity being in positions of leadership. And he's a flawed person. He, he wouldn't be afraid. President Trump w would not be afraid to tell you that he's a flawed person. If he ever asked me my opinion, I would say it would have been nice to hear you say you're sorry once in a while right? Because like nobody can lead in a big position like that and never be wrong, right? So look, there's plenty of things that we could talk about specifically. I'm going to choose a different route today. And when I said info at kingofkingswc.com, I mean it. Call me. You might be asking about what about the prophets? Were they wrong? There, there could be a billion different questions you have. We're not going anywhere. We're here. We will respond. I'll meet with you. We can have coffee. I'll go into as much detail as you want. I'll try to help you as much as I can because I could tell you from being on Wall Street and trying to witness to other believers that I've learned a lot about how secular people think. And, and they're, they're not just secular. They're wealthy secular people. So they have a lot of influence. And they're no different. But God right? But God, if God can speak through a donkey, he can speak through me, okay? So if I'm listening and I'm not trying to play the game by their standards. Now, the one thing about Jesus is he knew the law better than his opponents. His, his opponents tried to use the law against him, but he was able to quote it back to them better than they understood it. So what lesson that is for me is I'm not going to open my mouth if I haven't done my homework. I want to respect the other people enough to spend some time to understand what they believe, and in New York, that's a really important thing because when people know that you can tell them what their position is, even if you don't agree, you can engage in a, in a, in a dialogue, all right? Do you know what a straw man argument is? It's building something up that's really not very stable and trying to use that as your argument. That's been going on forever. Well, what about a steel man argument? Have you heard of that one yet? And that would be we sit down and we're going to have a conversation and we know that the other person disagrees with us. But we, out of respect to them, say, this is what I believe you think. Let me summarize it and then you tell me if I'm right or wrong and where I'm right or wrong. And then you do the same for me. That sounds like an impossible thing. It's not. I'm not making this up. This is, this is a common thing that people do that aren't even Christians. But if anybody would be doing it, it would be Jesus. 
And time and time again, when he met people that he knew were sinners, he did not start by condemning them. He met them, and he spoke to them, and he worked in a relationship with them, and then he gave them the truth in a way that they could understand it. And I believe every single person's different. So to just automatically pull out your pitch, this is what I'll say in every situation, devalues the other people. And I don't know about you, but I don't like it when people don't listen to me. I don't like it when I could be talking to them and I know they're not listening and they're just thinking of the next thing they're going to say to me. <laughs> well, if you don't like it when they do it to you, don't do it to them. <laughs> Think about some of the, of the warfare that we're involved with here. I, I quoted it earlier. It's Hebrews 6.18. It says, it's impossible for God to lie. Isn't that good? <laughs> Isn't that a good truth? As a result, we who come to God for refuge might be encouraged to seize the hope that is set before us. And that's an important thing to do right now in this inflammatory environment that we're in. And watch what you're saying, and watch what you say on Facebook. That stuff lasts up there forever. Okay, we get a lot of comments on our social media, and I read them all. And it's not because I'm trying to be a control freak. It helps me understand how people think. And some of them I delete and some of them I put up. And, you know, that's, that's I feel part of the obligation of doing this. And um, it's been really an eye-opener. Lots of compliments. We get lots of people thanking us for what we're putting up there. Because with all the garbage that's out on Facebook and YouTube, there's also great anointed messages that are being shared out there. And it's really helpful. So there's a hope that's been set before us. And here, the writer of Hebrews, which I believe is Paul. I know there's arguments against that. But whatever, you decide. He says... We might be encouraged to seize that hope. I love that word, seize it. You're seizing the hope that's set before us. It's real and true, an anchor to steady our restless souls. Common problem right now. A lot of restless souls. And that's not God, <laughs> right? He's peace. He speaks peace to storms. I'm not saying you should feel con condemned if you're feeling that restlessness. I'm saying there's hope for us. And we have to seize it. That's, that's the action word that he's given us here. Seize that hope for our restless soul. A hope that leads us back behind the curtain to where God is, as the high priest did in the days when reconciliation flowed from sacrifices in the temple. I know that's a mouthful, but you understand. The writer of Hebrews is comparing the New Testament priesthood that we have in Jesus with the Old Testament priesthood that had to keep bringing more and more sacrifices. And it was never enough. But we have a new priesthood now. Jesus is in the order of Melchizedek, not in the order of Levi. Another day's teaching, right? But that's what I believe Paul was saying. He went ahead on our behalf, and he's entered for us, and he's become a high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So when you bring a need to God, you don't have to do it by coming to a priest. You are a priest and a king in the New Testament dispensation. Whether you choose to operate in that fully is up to you. And you can say, well, I'm really busy. Okay, you know, I get it. I'm busy too. But you can either be too busy to pray or too busy not to pray. <laughs> I'm choosing the second one. <laughs> because if you're that busy and you're not praying, you're going to make a whole lot of mistakes. And that's really important now. And I have to be honest, I'm glad they didn't have social media when I was in high school because there would be some really bad things up on the internet about me. So I'm grateful that the Lord spared me from that. I'm not getting into the details on that one. Thank you, you're right. But let's just think about what our obligation is, right? Because we have to answer to the Lord someday for how we behave and all the decisions that we make. And I've said it many times, Trisha and I, I believe he's going to say to us, how did you take care of my kids? Which would be you and our children, you know, the people that you said you wanted to lead an organization, and they came and they were trusting in you, how did you take care of them? Because this is what he said to Peter on the beach, you know, that's how I picture it anyway, on the, wherever the fishermen were. And he said, Peter, do you love me? And do you remember what he said? Feed my sheep. Take care of my lambs. One way or another, it was the same answer three different times, right? And I know he denied the Lord three times, and there's a connection there. But what about that, though? Peter, do you love me? 
take care of my Christian people, take care of the believers, take care of the flock, the body of Christ. They need to be whole. They need people that they can rely on the character that they're not stealing the money from the church fund or having an affair with the secretary or, you, you know, you can name many ways that people have fallen. And, and that's partly why this is a difficult job because you're trying to represent Jesus as a minister and you can't live up completely to that, right? But people don't mind that as long as they sense you're trying. If you're a man or a woman after God's own heart, being perfect couldn't be the answer because nobody is. But we can be seeking after his heart. We can be like David, a man or woman after God's own heart. And when that happens, you have a big impact. People won't criticize you for not being perfect, but they can criticize you for not trying, especially as a leader. So Paul is saying, I'm getting the picture that when you meet together, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 11, 17, that when you meet together, it brings out your worst side instead of your best. <laughs> That's the message Bible. The message kind of cuts right to the heart, okay? And, and this shouldn't be, right? Like, wait a minute, when you get together, it's bringing out the worst in you. There's factions, there's competing, you're being disrespectful to the poor, you're not letting some of the people eat, you're getting drunk. You remember this, right? Now, that's a lot like America. Corinth was a lot like America. There's a whole wide range of things that happen in the name of God in a church that you might argue, really? But listen, until you start a church from scratch and do it, try not to be too harsh on the people in the ministry. It's a hard job, right, Kathy? <laughs> but that's okay. We're going to get the reward when we get to heaven. <laughs> and here, too. So he says, I get this report of your divisiveness, competing and criticizing each other. I'm reluctant to believe it, but there it is. The best that can be said for it is that the testing process will bring truth into the open and confirm it. Now, how does this apply to today, right, right now? It does apply because you might be sorry about some of the things you said on Facebook. You might feel like you, you need to go to apologize to some people. That's okay. That's what the Lord would expect us to do. Say, you know what? I was caught up in the heat of the moment, and I'm sorry. That's not who I want to be. Will you accept my apology? And if somebody else says that to you, say, yes, I accept your apology. Let them know that you do forgive them. And don't say, but. <laughs> All right? That's a good rule. That doesn't come, that's not a good place to put that word. I accept it. I forgive you. Let's pray. Not so easy, is it? And then he says in 1 Corinthians 15, Now this I say, brethren, that flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does corruption inherit incorruption. That's a verse that the Lord's been bringing up to me this week. Because we have to admit, this was a really tough week, wasn't it? Wednesday, really tough. What happened in D.C., really tough. And I know we could look at fake news and all, but... You know, I would even say, again, if I ever have the chance to meet President Trump, I don't know if I will or not. I said, that was probably not your best day on Wednesday when you gave that speech. I'm not even going by the fake news and all. And look, it's not my job to criticize him. I'm just saying there were some of the things that you could hear him say if it was taken through the wrong lens. It could have been taken the wrong way. Now, the next day, Thursday, he, did, he, he, he gave another speech that only took three minutes. And it was very important that he did that, I feel. Okay, now you can, you can say you're never coming back to church over that one. I don't know. I'm just telling you personally, I feel like we have to count on the rule of law in America. All right? Said I'm in the investment business. I'm curious. How many of you have a 401k plan on your job? A lot of hands going up. Have you ever had to go to a meeting sponsored by the company where somebody was in there explaining the investment choices that you have in the 401k? Is that easy to understand for most people? Most of you are all shaking your head. I'm the guy that was given those meetings, all right? Like, so that, that was part of my job, is to be that guy in the front of the room. And uh, why it's so confusing is we weren't taught about it well, and, and the thing that you're, that's most confusing is the amount of risk that's involved. Because the return part is a little easier, can be measured. The risk is really hard to measure. Why am I talking about that? Well, first of all, I live in that world, and why the Lord brought it up to me this week is that Part of, when people would ask me, which is safer? We would say, well, if you invest in big companies in the United States, that's probably the lowest risk kind of stock you can buy. Why? 
the rule of law. And I would use the example of the Bush-Gore election as a rule of law example. That we had an election, nothing, no bigger decision ever than the president, and it went all the way up to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court ruled there were no riots in the streets. In that case, the Democrats said, okay, we lost. Time to move on. Let's work harder. Let's learn from what happened, and let's move on. Now, look, again, I'm not comparing it. We're in a very different world right now. That was in early 2000s, right? There was no 10-month lockdown for the coronavirus. There was no Twitter. There was no Facebook. There was no YouTube. There was no, oh, man, I can't even name them all. They're good for some things, but really bad for others, okay? Because now there's something else, you know, as a portfolio manager, that's my job now. It's called confirmation bias. And again, I'm not trying to get technical. I'm just saying these are understood about humanity. Our, our behavior is not so unpredictable. And confirmation bias is believing what you already want to believe and being selective about which part you want to take. And if you watch the documentary Social Dilemma, hearing some heads nodding. How could you hear a head nod? Because they're going, yeah. <laughs> you will find out the bottom line of that is you are the product that's being sold, not the products that are being sold. What does that mean? Well, I was telling Dave Kerr at the beginning, he likes to hunt. Well, YouTube and Google and Facebook know that he likes to hunt. Why? because he goes on hunting websites and he looks for products and he dreams about bows and arrows. I don't know. <laughs> There's evidence of what he likes. So he's the product that's being sold to the different manufacturers of those products. But here's another really scary part of Social Dilemma is that I'm gonna just use a random example, uh, climate change, all right, that's a very, I want to say hot topic, but that's so lame. I know it's a hot topic, but that's like a lame way to say it. But there's plenty of people that don't believe it at all, and then there's plenty of people that do believe it, right? Fair enough? I'm not, I'm not weighing in on whether you should or shouldn't, but if I do believe that it's true, and I type in what is climate change, I'm going to be sent by Google in their algorithms to back up the position that I already believe. And if I don't believe in it over here, and I type in what is climate change, it's gonna say hoax. We think we're getting the first thing that would come up, but it's not. Yeah, wow. How come we never knew that? Because there's something called confirmation bias. We select what we already want to hear, and as human beings, we fill in a story. If we don't know what happened, or we're wired to just do this, to fill it in, to, to jump to conclusions. This is a no jumping zone. <laughs> Wait till you talk to the other person and say, this is the story I'm hearing in my brain. Tell me why it's wrong. This is how I'm filling in the blanks here. Tell me why I'm wrong. It's a good one, isn't it? That's Brene Brown. She's a psychologist and an author. Uh, I don't want to jump to the wrong conclusion. Okay, so you get it. We're Christians, a lot of them are not. Fair? We have Holy Spirit, we've been reading the Word, we made some major changes in our life and we submit to the authority of the Word. They have not, many times. I know it could also be another Christian, but leave that for another day. So does that give you any empathy for them? You remember that the Bible says that Jesus looked at the crowds and he saw them as sheep without a shepherd and he judged them? No, he had compassion on them, right? So why is that any different? Like I said, if I'm in New York City and I'm talking to some young person that gets hired and they're making a lot of money and in their culture, if you're 25 in New York City and making a lot of money, the idea of sleeping around is just a given. And we're saying, well, no, there's actually a better way. I mean, you better have an ability to have a trust relationship with them for them to want to listen to you. Do we believe it's a better way? Yes. Is it easy to explain it to them? No. But with the Lord's help, it is. Because you have an open heaven over your life. And he wants to tell you, seek me, and you'll find what you need to say to that person that I love, who's bound for hell right now. 
one of the comments we got is that we want to plunder hell and populate heaven. Isn't that a good one? Oh, man, I really like that. That's a good mission statement. Plunder hell, populate heaven. Could preach for a while on that one. I thank that guy. So, you know, this isn't hard for us to understand, 2 Corinthians 4.18. We don't look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen. That sounds confusing. If you're not saved, what do you mean? That sounds like a contradiction. But if you're a Christian, it doesn't, does it? Because you know that there's, God has worked so mightily in your life that you might not be able to prove it in a, in a, in a laboratory, but you know he's real. But they don't yet. So we're looking at things that are not seen. For the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. So regardless of who the president is, Jesus is still king of kings, lord of lords. Over the whole universe, before Abraham was, he said, I, I am. Whoa, that's a heavy statement, isn't it? So I'm trying to help you, if I can, cut people a little slack right now. We've never had 10 months in lockdown. We've never had the amount of pain and the lack of grieving if, if a loved one dies and you didn't get to go to do a funeral service or, or all the things that we became so accustomed to. People are postponing their weddings, like major events in their life that they can't do. And, and we're going to just expect them to operate fully functioning on all cylinders? No. So they might say things or do things now that they're going to be held against it because everybody's filming everything you say. So when in doubt, back off a little bit, dial it down a little bit. And, and that's really true right now about what you're saying, especially online, right? And, and that's where I'll end because there was a lot said this week. Oh, my God, was there a lot said. And at first I started to think, what should I do on Sunday? Should I just download some of the transcripts from this stuff and print it out and put it in the back? I'm like, no. But, you know, the research part of me, the portfolio manager part of me, wants to be able to pre present some evidence. Because <laughs> people are saying, and no, this is how it works in our business. We will get in a room, and there will be a discussion about which companies we're supposed to put in the portfolio. And everybody comes to the table. And I'll be honest with you, the first thing we're thinking is, I plan to learn something when I go in there. I know these other people have our best interests at heart. We're part of the same company and that they're going to bring something to the table that I might not be aware of yet. And anybody here a constitutional lawyer? Balcony? Lights are kind of bright. Okay. So could we just acknowledge that it's probably a pretty complicated thing <laughs> to be a constitutional lawyer? Because one of the questions I got is, what about Vice President Pence? All right, I don't want to weigh in on that because I haven't had time to do all the homework of what all the options are on that. Do I know he's a Christian? Yeah. Do I know he was in a tough position? Yeah. Do I know what I would have done if I was him? No. No idea how I would have been able to handle that. Or Vice President of the United States? Me? You know how hard that job is? So, oh, he shouldn't have done this, or he should have done that. Like, okay, I get it. It's emotional. But really? You want to be in his position? No. So let's just back down a little bit about he's a traitor, he's this, he's that. No, I don't know. I haven't done all the homework. It would take a while. But I'll be honest. I do like a guy on uh, Internet named Ben Shapiro. Okay, you can take it or leave it. I'm not telling you you should listen or not. But he's a Harvard Law School grad. So I'm just telling you, he knows more about this than I do. And he came out with no agenda. I mean, really, he's not a Christian. If he thought Pence did the wrong thing, he would have said it. And I'm only using this as an example, okay? Because he's got his agenda. I mean, I'm not saying Ben Shapiro was Jesus. But he graduated from Harvard Law, and he's a conservative guy. And, and I've, I've really benefited from other things, he said. So that's all, right? Because if I'm in the portfolio meeting and, and we're talking about a science company, I don't know anything about science. Right? So I'm going to depend upon the expert there. And it's the same thing in life now. It's really complicated. Life is way more complicated than it used to be, even in medicine. Okay? So that's an example. Politics super complicated. So let's just try at least to start in 1 Corinthians 13. It says, love believes the best, including about your relatives who disagree with you about politics. Because if you lose the relationship, you lose the door to speak to them. 
not, I don't know, the Lord says he doesn't want one person to perish. So this is what I'm going to choose to focus on. I'm sure you already probably read it. That was rude of you because I was talking. <laughs> That's called guilt trip. We don't believe in that. <laughs> yeah, you could say, well, why did you pick that one? And why couldn't you put something else up there? Blah, blah, blah. Well, you know, when you plant a church, you can say what you want to. <laughs> I, uh, maybe one little example I'll just give you because I know it's late. Uh, I played football. I had a full scholarship to play college football. So I was you know, a pretty advanced player. And uh, a couple years ago, I was at a party for the playoffs for the NFL. And we were watching a game between the Saints and the Rams. And whoever won this game was going to go to the Super Bowl in two weeks. And near the end of the game, Drew Brees throws a pass. And the receiver's about to catch it. And he gets hit by one of the Rams. He got rammed by one of the Rams before the ball got into his hands. <laughs> And as I'm sitting there, I said, oh, man, this is going to lock it up for the Saints because that's such a blatant penalty. The ref has to call this penalty. And the other two guys that were sitting next to me said, oh, no, that wasn't a penalty. I, would, I said, what? You don't think that was a penalty? Like, we were looking at the exact same thing. So there's lesson one. Two people could see the same thing through two totally different lenses. And this is what I said. Let's meet again next year. And I will bet you when we Google worst missed call in the history of the NFL. This is going to be listed as the worst call. And you don't even think it was a penalty. And I wasn't getting that heated about it. I was just kind of like, I was shocked. So I Googled it this morning just to see if I was right. <laughs> you do it yourself. Worst call in NFL history. But these two people didn't agree with me, right? To me, it was blatantly obvious. There was no other way to look at it. And yet, right in the same room, Two agreed with each other. Oh, no, he couldn't have caught. That was uncatchable, if you know anything about football. So that's all I'm saying is that they believed it. They had full conviction, and that's just not how life is, that everybody's just going to automatically agree with you. So this is what he said. Congress has certified the results. Am I thrilled about that personally? No, I'm not. Was it the outcome I was hoping for? Abortion alone, we could talk about why this wouldn't have been a great outcome. But there's something called due process in America. You get a chance to make your case. But you have to produce evidence. All right, so there's another thing they'd say in the portfolio meeting. Ten years from now, if we were in a room together and you said to pick this company, what do you think they're going to say? <laughs> now, you don't know that, but you could be a little prophetic. And 10 years from now, when you talk to your children about the election, they're too young to understand. What are you going to say? I'm not going to answer for you, but there was due process. The courts were open. If it was a hoax election, there should have been some evidence. And you could say that there is. Oh, that's great. But it needed to be delivered within that window of time. And that shouldn't make you sad. My opinion bigger picture, be happy that we have the rule of law in America. We have to have that. Otherwise, it would be chaos, right? And let's just say Vice President Pence did decide to say we have more authority than you. What's going to happen four years from now? Is the Vice President then going to say, sorry, we don't like the outcome, so we're changing this election? Again, I'm using it as an example because I don't know the details, but there's a lot to like about having the rule of law, just not right now, because you might not be happy about the election, how the election turned out. But I wouldn't want to live anywhere else than America. How about you? <laughs> Flawed as we might be, it's still the best system. And by the way, I'm not moving to Texas either. <laughs> a lot of people from California seem to be going there. Uh, no, we feel called right here with our paisans. Hey, who's got the meatballs? He said a new administration will be inaugurated on January 20th. That's what President Trump said. Okay? It's not what he said on Wednesday. This is what he said on Thursday. All right? So, meaning we exercised our rights as Americans. We brought the due process 
to the table. We brought the evidence that we did have. It wasn't enough to change. And if you want to start saying every single person that disagreed with him was wrong, fine. It's a free country, still. Glad it's still a free country. But 10 years from now, it's going to be harder to convince people that the Supreme Court said there wasn't enough information. All these people right down the line that have been big supporters said, you know, sometimes you just have to look at the facts, even when you don't like it. It's not easy. But he said a new administration will be inaugurated on January 20th. My focus now turns to ensuring a smooth, orderly, and seamless transition of power. Even though I don't like it, he could have said. But that's the focus. You have to decide which part of this, and I understand you, you have the right to do whatever you want, okay? If I'm trying to bring an idea to the table to convince somebody that we should invest in this company, they're gonna want more than my opinion. <laughs> You're gonna say, what are you basing your opinion on? Okay, that's, that's okay, There's nothing wrong with that. You, you, you're gonna have a hard time winning a court case with no evidence. So why not we pray that way? Lord, uncover the corruption. I mean, we're from New Jersey. Do we understand political corruption? <sighs> Thank you. <laughs> this moment calls for healing and reconciliation. That's what he said. Do we believe him? Because some of the comments that came in didn't. Yeah, no, they said somebody shoved a speech in front of him and told him to read it. No, he said it. We have evidence of it. He made the recording. So let's stand. I say let's let the, the reconciliation and healing start with us. And nothing's impossible for God, okay? It's not over. When God's in it, there's no limit. So just because I can't explain how it could change doesn't matter. I'm not God. But we can sure pray that we don't have blinders on our eyes and that we're not suffering from that, the opposite of what Jesus said, which is you gotta treat other people the way you'd wanna be treated if you were them. And like Trisha said, that means respecting them and loving them even when they disagree with you. Can we just lift our hands for a minute? The Bible says a house divided cannot stand. If Satan tries to cast out Satan, how is he? That's Luke chapter 11. Look it up, okay? Because this is part of the warfare. The enemy knows if the church is divided among themselves, we lose power. Don't allow this thing to be a stumbling block. Come to the table and say, we're still praying for America. We're still praying for our politicians. That hasn't changed. It goes all the way back to the New Testament. Pray for those that are in authority. They have a difficult job. And pray that their eyes are opened. So Lord, we just lift up America to you right now. We've quoted it so often that if we just would get down on our face and repent, if your people, we are your people, called by your name, if we would humble ourselves and pray and purpose to seek your face and not preach a watered down gospel, but speak the truth. We're not tickling people's ears to say what they want to hear. We're going to give the truth, but we'll do it in love. For purpose to seek your face and turn from our wicked ways, then you said you would hear from heaven and heal our land. So I just pray, Lord, you're anointing the oil of your presence to be upon our lives, that we can live with one another, that we can walk through life with one another, we can forgive one another for, for bursts of anger or bursts of emotional hijacking when things happen to us because we need each other. And we say, no weapon formed against your church will prosper, that those tongues that rise up against you, Lord, will be brought down, that we will take captive every thought to the obedience of Christ, and that we will be a blessing because you've blessed us, we're gonna be a blessing. We're gonna see people saved. We're gonna feed the poor. We're gonna be members of the community that are giving people the truth regardless of who's in office. Help us, Lord. Could you say that? Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord, to know your perfect will for my life. Say it with me. I want to find the narrow road that leads to life and avoid 
the wide road that leads to destruction. I need your power working in my life, Lord, through your Holy Spirit. Be the spirit of truth for me, the lamp unto my feet, the light unto my path. Let me do, I hope you mean this now, great exploits for the kingdom of God in Jesus' name. Amen. Love you all very much. And uh, I heard one guy say, do we have any last time visitors here today? <laughs> so, <laughs> I'm sorry if that's you, but I'm trying my best. I'd love to have a cup of coffee. If you want to talk about anything, you can have as much time as you need, because I know this has been difficult. Love you all. <laughs>